Book Three, Chapter Three, of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Three, Houghton Tower. Chapter Three, Middleton Hall. Middleton Hall, the residence of Sir Richard Asherton, was a large quadrangular structure, built entirely of timber, and painted externally in black and white checker work, fanciful and varied in design, in the style peculiar to the better class of Tudor houses in South Lancashire and Cheshire. Surrounded by a deep moat, supplied by a neighbouring stream, and crossed by four drawbridges, each faced by a gateway, this vast pile of building was divided into two spacious courts, one of which contained the stables, barns, and offices, while the other was reserved for the family and the guests, by whom the hospitable mansion was almost constantly crowded. In the last-mentioned part of the house was a great gallery, with deeply embayed windows, and filled with painted glass. A floor of polished oak, walls of the same dark, lustrous material, hung with portraits of stiff beauties, some in rough and farthingale, and some in a costume of an earlier period, among whom was Margaret Barton, who brought the manor of Middleton into the family. Frowning warriors, beginning with Sir Ralph Asherton, Knight Marshal of England in the reign of Edward the Fourth, and surnamed the Black of Asherton Underline, the founder of the house, and husband of Margaret Barton, before mentioned, and ending with Sir Richard Asherton, grandfather of the present owner of the mansion, and one of the heroes of Flodden. Grave lawyers, or graver divines, a likeness running through all, and showing they belonged to one line. A huge carved mantelpiece, massive tables of walnut or oak, and black, and shining as ebony, set round with high-backed chairs. Here also, above stairs, there were long corridors, looking out through lattices upon the court, and communicating with the almost countless dormitories, while on the floor beneath, corresponding passages led to all the principal chambers, and terminated in the grand entrance hall, the roof of which, being open and intersected by enormous rafters and crooks of oak, like the ribs of some tall amiral, was thought from this circumstance, as well of its form, to resemble a ship turned upside down. The lower beams were elaborately carved, and ornamented with gilded bosses and sculptured images, sustaining shields emblazoned with the armorial bearings of the Ashertons. As many as three hundred matchlocks, in good and serviceable condition, were ranged round the entrance hall, besides corslets, salmain rivets, steel caps, and other accoutrements, this stand of arms having been collected by Sir Richard's predecessor, during the military muster made in the county in 1574, when he had raised and equipped a troop of horse for Queen Elizabeth. Outside the mansion was a garden, charmingly laid out in parterres and walks, and not only carried to the edge of the moat, but continued beyond it, till it reached a high knoll, crowned with beech-trees. A crest of tall, twisted chimneys, a high roof with quaintly carved gables surmounted by many gilt vanes, may serve to complete the picture of Middleton Hall. On a lovely summer evening, two young persons of opposite sexes were seated on a bench placed at the foot of one of the largest and most umbrageous of the beech-trees, crowning the pleasant eminence before mentioned, and though differing in aspect and character, the one being excessively fair, with tresses as light and fleecy as the clouds above them, and eyes as blue and tender as the skies, and the other distinguished by great manly beauty, though in a totally different style. Still there was a sufficiently strong likeness between them to proclaim them brother and sister. Profound melancholy pervaded the countenance of the young man, whose handsome brow was clouded by care while the girl, though sad, seemed so only from sympathy. They were conversing together in deep and earnest tones, showing how greatly they were interested, and as they proceeded, many an involuntary sigh was heaved by Richard Asherton, while a tear more than once dimmed the brightness of his sister's eyes, and her hand sought by its gentle pressure to reassure him. They were talking of Alison, of her peculiar and distressing situation, and of the young man's hopeless love for her, 
She was the general theme of their discourse, for Richard's sole comfort was in pouring forth his griefs into his sister's willing ear. But new causes of anxiety had been given them by Nicholas, who had arrived that afternoon bringing intelligence of James Device's capture, and of his threats against Mistress Nutter. The squire had only just departed, having succeeded in the twofold object of his visit, which was firstly to borrow three hundred pounds from his cousin, and secondly to induce him to attend the meeting at Horton Tower. With the first request Richard willingly complied, and he assented, though with some reluctance, to the second, providing nothing of serious moment should occur in the interim. Nicholas tried to rally him on his despondency, endeavouring to convince him that all would come right in time, and that his misgivings were causeless. But his arguments were ineffectual, and he was soon compelled to desist. The squire would fain also have seen Alison, but understanding she always remained secluded in her chamber till eventide, he did not press the point. Richard urged him to stay over the night, alleging the length of the ride and the speedy approach of evening as inducements to him to remain, but on this score the squire was resolute, and having carefully secured the large sum of money he had obtained beneath his doublet, he mounted his favourite steed, Robin, who seemed as fresh as if he had not achieved upwards of thirty miles that morning, and rode off. Richard watched him cross the drawbridge, and take the road towards Rochdale, and after exchanging a farewell wave of the hand with him, returned to the hall and sought out his sister. Dorothy was easily persuaded to take a turn in the garden with her brother, and during their walk he confided to her all he had heard from Nicholas. Her alarm at Jem Device's threat was much greater than his own, and though she entertained a strong and unconquerable aversion to Mistress Nutter, and could not be brought to believe in the sincerity of her penitence, still, for Alison's sake, she dreaded lest any harm should befall her, and more particularly desired to avoid the disgrace which would be inflicted by a public execution. Alison, she was sure, would not survive such a catastrophe, and therefore at all risks it must be averted. Richard did not share to the same extent in her apprehensions, because he had been assured by Nicholas that Mistress Nutter would be removed to a place of perfect security, and because he was disposed with the squire to regard the prisoner's threats as mere ravings of impotent malice. Still, he could not help feeling great uneasiness. Vague fears, too, beset him, which he found it in vain to shake off, but he did not communicate them to his sister, as he knew the terrifying effect they would have on her timid nature, and he therefore kept the mental anguish he endured to himself, hoping ere long it would diminish in intensity. But in this he was deceived, for instead of abating, his gloom and depression momently increased. Almost unconsciously Richard and his sister had quitted the garden, proceeding with slow and melancholy steps to the beech-crowned knoll. The seat they had chosen was a favourite one with Alison, and she came thither on most evenings, either accompanied by Dorothy or alone. Here it was that Richard had more than once passionately besought her to become his bride, receiving on both occasions the same meek yet firm refusal. To Dorothy also, who pleaded her brother's cause with all that eloquence and fervour of which she was mistress, Alison replied that her affections were fixed upon Richard, but that while her mother lived and needed her constant prayers, they must not be withheld, and that looking upon any earthly passion as a criminal interference with this paramount duty, she did not dare to indulge it. Dorothy represented to her that the sacrifice was greater than she was called upon to make, that her health was visibly declining, and that she might fall a victim to her overzeal. But Alison was deaf to her remonstrances, as she had been to the entreaties of Richard. With hearts less burdened, the contemplation of the scene before them could not have failed to give delight to Richard and his sister, and even amid the adverse circumstances under which it was viewed, its beauty and tranquillity produced a soothing influence. Evening was gradually stealing on, and all the exquisite tints marking that delightful hour were spreading over the landscape. The sun was setting gorgeously, and a flood of radiance fell upon the old mansion beneath them and upon the grey and venerable church situated on a hill adjoining it. The sounds were all in unison with the hour, and the lowing of cattle, 
the voices of the husbandmen returning from their work, mingled with the cawing of the rooks newly alighted on the high trees near the church, told them that bird, man, and beast were seeking their home for the night. But though Richard's eye dwelt upon the fair garden beneath him, embracing all of its terraces, green slopes, and trim pastures, though it fell upon the moat, belting the hall like a glittering zone, though it rested upon the church tower, and, roaming over the park beyond it, finally settled upon the range of hills bounding the horizon, which have not inaptly been termed the English Apennines, though he saw all these things, he thought not of them, neither was he conscious of the sounds that met his ear, and which all spoke of rest from labour and peace. Darker and deeper grew his melancholy. He began to persuade himself that he was not long for this world, and while gazing upon the beautiful prospect before him, was perhaps looking upon it for the last time. For some minutes Dorothy watched him anxiously, and at last, receiving no answer to her questions, and alarmed by the expression of his countenance, she flung her arms round his neck and burst into tears. It was now Richard's turn to console her, and he inquired with much anxiety as to the cause of this sudden outburst of grief. "'You yourself are the cause of it, dear Richard,' replied Dorothy, regarding him with brimming eyes. "'I cannot bear to see you so unhappy. If you suffer this melancholy to grow upon you, it will affect both mind and body. Just now your countenance wore an expression most distressing to look upon.' "'Try to smile, dear Richard, if only to cheer me, or else I shall grow as sad as you. "'Ah, me! I have known the day, and not long since either, when on a pleasant summer evening like this "'you would propose a stroll into the park with me, and when there would trip along the glades as fleetly as a deer, "'and defy me to catch you. But you always took care I should, though. Ah, "'Come, there is a little attempt at a smile, that's something.' "'You look more like yourself now. "'How happy we used to be in those days, to be sure, and how merry! "'You would make the courts ring with your blithe laughter, "'and well-nigh kill me with your jests. "'If love is to make one mope like an owl, "'and sigh like the wind through a half-shut casement, "'if it is to cause one to lose one's rosy complexion and gay spirit, "'and forget how to dance and sing, "'take no pleasure in hawking and hunting or any kind of sport, "'Walk about with eyes fixed upon the ground, muttering and with disordered attire. "'If it is to make one silent when one should be talkative, "'grave when one should be gay, heedless when one should listen, "'if it is to do all this, defend me from the tender passion, "'I hope I shall never fall in love.' Oh, "'I hope you never will, dear Dorothy,' replied Richard, "'pressing her hand affectionately. "'If your love is to be attended with such unhappy results as mine,' "'I know not how it is, but I feel unusually despondent this evening, "'and I'm haunted by a thousand dismal fancies. "'But I will do my best to dismiss them, "'and with your help no doubt I shall succeed.' "'There, that was a smile in earnest,' cried Dorothy, brightening up. "'Oh, Richard, I'm quite happy now. "'And after all I do not see why you should take such a gloomy view of things.' I have no doubt there is a great deal, a very great deal of happiness in store for you and Alison. I must couple her name with yours, or you will not allow it to be happiness. If you can only be brought to think so, I am quite sure of it, and you shall see how nicely I can make the matter out. As thus, Mistress Nutter is certain to die soon. Such a wicked woman cannot live long. "'Don't be angry with me for calling her wicked, Richard, "'but you know I can never forget her unhallowed proceedings "'in the convent church at Whaley, "'where I was so nearly becoming a witch myself. "'Well, as I was saying, she cannot live long, "'and when she goes, and heaven grant it may be soon, "'Alison no doubt will mourn for her, though I shall not, "'and after a decent interval, "'then, Richard, she will no longer say you nay, "'but will make you happy as your wife.' "'They do not look so sad again, dear brother. "'I thought I should make you quite cheerful by the picture I was drawing.' "'It is because I fear it will never be realised that I am sad, Dorothy,' replied Richard. "'My own anticipations are the opposite of yours, "'and paint Alison sinking into an early grave before her mother, "'while as to myself, if such be the case, I shall not long survive her.' "'Nay, now you will make me weep again,' cried Dorothy, her tears flowing afresh.' 
"'But I will not allow you to indulge such gloomy ideas, Richard. "'If I seriously thought Mistress Nutter likely to occasion all this fresh mischief, "'I would cause her to be delivered up to justice and hanged out of the way. "'You may look cross at me, but I would. "'What is an old witch like her, compared with two young handsome persons dying for love of each other, "'and yet not able to marry on her account?' "'Dorothy, Dorothy, you must put some restraint on your tongue.' said Richard. You give it sadly too much license. You forget it is the wish of the unhappy lady you refer to to expiate her offences at the stake, and that it is only out of consideration to her daughter that she has been induced to remain in concealment. What will be the issue of it all I dare scarcely conjecture. Woe to her, I fear. Woe to Alison. Woe to me. Alas, Richard, that you should link yourself to her fate!' exclaimed Dorothy, half mournfully, half reproachfully. "'I cannot help it,' he replied. "'It is my destiny, a deplorable destiny, if you will, but not to be avoided. That Mistress Nutter will escape the consequences of her crimes, I can scarcely believe. Her penitence is profound and sincere, and that is a great consolation, for I trust she will not perish body and soul.' I should wish her to have some spiritual assistance, but this Nicholas will not for the present permit, alleging that no churchman would consent to screen her from justice when he became aware, as he must, by her confession, of the nature and magnitude of her offences. This may be true, but when the wretches who have been leaguered with her in iniquity are disposed of, the reason will no longer exist, and I will see that she is cared for. But apart from her mother— I have another source of anxiety respecting Alison. It is this. Orders have been this day given for the arrest of Elizabeth Device and her daughter Janet, and Alison will be the chief witness against them. This will be a great trouble to her. Undoubtedly, rejoined Dorothy with much concern. But can it not be avoided? I fear not, said Richard, and I blame Nicholas much for his precipitancy in giving the order. But he replied he had been held up latterly as a favourer of witches, and must endeavour to redeem his character by a display of severity. Were it not for Alison, I should rejoice that the noxious brood should at last be utterly exterminated. "'And so should I in good sooth,' responded Dorothy. "'As to Elizabeth Device, she is bad enough for anything, and capable of almost any mischief. But she is nothing to Janet.' who, I am persuaded, would become a second mother Demdike if her career were not cut short. You have seen the child, and know what an ill-favoured, deformed little creature she is, with round shoulders, eyes set strangely in her face, and such a malicious expression. Oh, I shudder to think of it. And she covered her face with her hands, as if to shut out some unpleasant object. Poor predestined child of sin! branded by nature from her birth, and charged with wicked passions as the snake with venom. "'I cannot but pity her!' exclaimed Richard. "'Compassion is entirely thrown away,' he added, with a sudden change of manner, and as if trying to shake off a weakness. "'The poisonous fruit must, however, be nipped in the bud. Better she should perish now, even though comparatively guiltless, than hereafter, with a soul stained with crime like her mother.' As he concluded, he put his hand quickly to his side, for a sharp and sudden pang shot through his heart, and so acute was the pain that after struggling against it for a moment he groaned deeply, and would have fallen if his sister, greatly alarmed, and with difficulty repressing a scream, had not lent him support. Neither of them were aware of the presence of a little girl, who had approached the place where they were sitting, with footsteps so light that the grass scarcely seemed to bend beneath them, and who, ensconcing herself behind the tree, drank in their discourse with eager ears. She was attended by a large black cat, who, climbing the tree, placed himself on a bough above her. During the latter part of the conversation, and when it turned upon the arrest of Janet and her mother, the expression of the child's countenance, malicious enough to begin with, became desperately malignant, and she was only restrained by certain signs from the cat— which appeared to be intelligible to her, from some act of mischief. At last even this failed, and before the animal could descend and check her, she crept round the bole of the tree, so as to bring herself close to Richard, 
and muttering a spell, made one or two passes behind his back, touched him with the point of her finger, but so lightly that he was unconscious of the pressure, and then hastily retreated with the cat, who glared furiously at her from his flaming orbs. It was at the moment she touched him that Richard felt as if an arrow were quivering in his heart. Poor Dorothy's alarm was so great that she could not even scream for assistance, and she feared if she quitted her brother he would expire before her return. But the agony, though great, was speedily over, and as the spasm ceased he looked up, and with a faint smile strove to reassure her. "'Do not be alarmed,' he said. "'It is nothing. A, a momentary faintness, that is all.' But the damp upon his brow, and the deathly hue of his cheek, contradicted the assertion, and showed how much he had endured. "'It was more than momentary faintness, dear Richard,' replied Dorothy. "'It was a frightful seizure, so frightful that I almost feared. But no matter. You know I am easily alarmed. Thank God here is some colour coming into your cheeks. You are better now, I see. Lean upon me, and let us return to the house.' "'I can walk unassisted,' said Richard, rising with an effort. "'Do not despise my feeble aid,' replied Dorothy, taking his arm under her own. "'You will be quite well soon.' "'I am quite well now,' said Richard, halting after he had advanced a few paces. "'The attack is altogether past. Oh. "'Do you not see Alison coming towards us? "'Not a word of this sudden seizure to her. "'Do you mind, Dorothy?' Alison was soon close behind them, and though in obedience to Richard's injunctions no allusion was made to his recent illness, she at once perceived he was suffering greatly, and with much solicitude inquired into the cause. Richard avoided giving a direct answer, and immediately entering upon Nicholas's visit, tried to divert her attention from himself. So great a change had been wrought in Alison's appearance and manner during the last few weeks that she could scarcely be recognised. Still beautiful as ever, her beauty had lost the earthly character, and had become in the highest degree spiritualised and refined. Humility of deportment and resignation of look, blended with an expression of religious fervour, gave her the appearance of one of the early martyrs. Unremitting ardour in the pursuance of her devotional exercises by day, and long vigils at night, had worn down her frame, and robbed it of some of its grace and fullness of outline, but this attenuation had a charm of its own, and gave a touching interest to the figure which was wanting before. If her cheek was thinner and paler, her eyes looked larger and brighter, and more akin to the stars in splendour, and if she appeared less childlike, less joyous, less free from care, the want of these qualities was more than counterbalanced by increased gentleness, resignation, and serenity. Deeply interested in all Richard told her of her mother, she was greatly concerned to hear of the intended arrest of Elizabeth and Janet Device, especially the latter, for this unhappy and misguided child she had once entertained the affection of a sister, and it could not be but a source of grief to her to reflect upon her probable fate. Little more passed between them, for Richard, feeling his strength again fail him, was anxious to reach the house, and Dorothy was quite unequal to conversation. They parted at the door, and as Alison, after taking leave of her friends, turned to continue her walk in the garden, Richard staggered into the entrance hall, and sank upon a chair. Alison desired to be alone, for she did not wish to have a witness to the grief that overpowered her, and which, when she had gained a retired part of the garden, where she supposed herself free from all observation, found relief in a flood of tears. For some minutes she was a prey to violent and irrepressible emotion, and had scarcely regained a show of composure when she heard herself addressed, as she thought, in the voice of the very child whose unlucky fate she was deploring. Looking round in surprise and seeing no one, she began to think fancy must have cheated her, when a low malicious laugh, arising from a shrubbery near her, convinced her that Janet was hidden there, and the next moment the little girl stepped from out of the trees. Alison's first impulse was to catch the child in her arms and press her to her bosom, but there was something in Janet's look that deterred her, and so embarrassed her that she was unable to bestow upon her the ordinary greeting of affection, or even approach her. Janet seemed to enjoy her confusion, 
and laughed spitefully. "'You done the same hour glad to see me, Sister Alison,' said Janet at length. "'Sister Alison!' There was something in the term that now jarred upon the young girl's ears, but she strove to conquer the feeling as unworthy of her. "'She was once my sister,' she thought, "'and shall be so still. I will save her if it is possible. "'Janet!' she added aloud, "'I know not what chance brings you here, and though I may not give you the welcome you expect, I am rejoiced to see you, because I may be the means of serving you. Do not be alarmed at what I am going to tell you. The danger, I hope, is past, or at all events may be avoided. Your liberty is threatened, and at the very moment I see you here I was lamenting your supposed condition as a prisoner.' Janet laughed louder and more spitefully than before, and looked so like a little fury that Alison's blood ran cold at the sight of it. "'I know it all, Sister Alison," she cried, "'and that is why I have come, dear. Brother Jem's a prisoner in Whaley Abbey. Mother's a prisoner there, too, and I should have kept them company if Tib hadn't brought me off. Now listen to me, Alison, for this is my business with you. You mun get Mother and Jem out to-night. Ah, to-night you can do it if you win, and unless you do, but I winna threaten you till I get your answer. How am I to set them free? asked Alison, greatly alarmed. "'You need only say the word to young Richard Dasherton, and the job's done,' replied Janet. "'I refuse, positively refuse, to do so,' rejoined Alison indignantly. "'Very well,' cried Janet, with a look of concentrated malice and fury. "'Then take the consequences. The wind be turned to Lancaster Castle, and lose their lives there. But you shouldn't go too, ah, and be burnt as a witch. A witch, do you mark, wench, eh? I defy your malice, cried Alison. Defy me, screamed Janet. What o, oh, Tib? And at the call a huge black cat sprang from out of the shrubbery. Tear her flesh from her bones, cried the little girl, pointing to Alison, and stamping furiously on the ground. Tib erected his back and glared like a tiger, but he seemed unwilling or unable to obey the order. Alison, who had completely recovered her courage, regarded him fixedly, and apparently without terror. "'Why dost not say so, and tear her in pieces?' cried the infuriated child. "'He dares not. He has no power over me,' said Alison. "'Oh, Janet, cast him off. Your wicked agent appears to befriend you now, but he will lead you to certain destruction.' "'Come with me, and I will save you.' "'Off!' cried Janet, repelling her with furious gestures. "'Off! I winna go wi' you. I winna be saved, as you term it. I hate you more than ever, and I would strike you dead at my feet if I could. But as I canna do it, I would find some other means of injuring you. So look to yourself, proud lady, look to yourself.' i already smitten you in a place where you win feel it so, and I win repeat the blow. And I'll leave you, but we shall meet again. Come along, Tib. So saying, she sprang into the shrubbery, followed by the cat, leaving Alison appalled by her frightful malignity. End of chapter 3